FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Carrie Lutz. It's July 9th, 2018. So first, as always, join the conversation, join the show, be part of it. Send us your emails to kl at kerrylutz.com. I'm like almost caught up, only about two dozen in the uh, inbox that need to be addressed. So if we like your question, we read it on the show, promise. So anyways, the email address is kl at kerrylutz.com. Well, where's our economy heading? Are we at the end of the cycle? Are we at the beginning of the end or the end of the beginning? That's always the question. John Rabino is with us now of dollarcollapse.com. Happy Monday, John. Hey, Kerry. So we what we got a question here from Jesse, loyal, loyal FSN community member. It's been uh, been communicating for years. So there's a lot here, but Basically, he's asking about the employment numbers. Two questions. Employment numbers. We've seen uh, more people supposedly employed, rosy numbers, and yet the workforce participation rate can't break 63%. The second question is, what's going on with copper? Uh, copper collapsed in the past couple of weeks. It went from you know around 320 a pound to less than three dollars a pound now. I'll tell you the exact price. Uh, it's two ninety a pound right this particular minute, and it's up four cents, almost five cents from last week. So, what is Doctor Copper telling us? Is it all manipulation? Is it a dollar play? Blah blah blah. Anyways, that's what Jesse had to ask. So, what's your take on it? Employment first. Well, it, it, unemployment numbers have been distorted in this recovery because labor force participation rates have been so low. In other words, there have been a lot of people who just haven't been looking for work. They aren't working, they're not looking for work, so they don't show up in the uh, the government's numbers. Um, and as you mentioned, it's a huge number. It's multiple millions of people who are of an age who, who could be working, but they're not. And that's been this mystery. And it's also distorted the unemployment headline number, made it look way lower, the unemployment rate, than, um, than it should be. Well, now that's starting to reverse. People are starting to come back into the workforce, and that is raising the unemployment number. So that's a sign that um, the, the labor markets actually are pretty tight, given the people that are available. You know, you're seeing all these anecdotal stories about employers not being able to find anybody to work for them. And so they're doing away with drug tests and then they're going to the local jail and interviewing people who might get out pretty soon, see if they want to come to work. Um, so you got that on the one hand, extreme tightness um, within the existing labor pool. But then you've got this gigantic pool of people out there who for some reason aren't working. And as you said, some of it is, is baby boomers who are retiring and that's legit. You know, if you're 70 years old, um, you, you can't be expected necessarily to be in the workforce, but there are also a lot of people of working age who, for whatever reason, aren't in the workforce and they're starting to come back in. And that's going to, I don't want to say artificially, I think it's going to bring the unemployment headline number back to reality as those people come back in, which means unemployment, as the government reports it, will be higher going forward. Mm -hmm. Having said all that, I think the uh, the general tenor of the labor market is pretty tight right now. Uh, these anecdotal stories haven't filtered over to actual wage growth numbers yet. Wages in general aren't rising, but if this keeps up, they will have to because w within the, uh, the universe of anecdotal stories, companies are raising their pay, among other things. They're offering a lot of different perks. Um, but they're also raising base pay for a lot of people, which means wage inflation is out there waiting to happen. Now we have to see going forward whether all the new people coming into the workforce will balance out the fact that there just aren't enough people to begin with to um, to take up all the jobs that are available. Uh, and, and we won't know how that plays out until after the fact because this is uncharted territory. But I think there's a good chance 
that even with people coming back into the labor force, wages start to rise going forward. And that gives us the kind of wage inflation. See, that's a version of inflation that the Fed understands. They seem to ignore asset inflation. In other words, if the stock market goes up or bonds go up or houses get more expensive, they don't count that as inflation. But the minute people start making more money, they count that as inflation. And that's going to put pressure on the Fed to tighten, you know, according to their own analytical framework. Um, they've got inflation and they should be raising interest rates. So I think that's going to be one of the big stories going forward is quantitative tightening, replacing quantitative easing. Uh, and that's bad news for the markets in general, and especially the really overvalued sector of the stock market, uh, which is big tech. So I, I think we're going to see higher interest rates over time impact asset prices, which is getting away from the unemployment thing. But uh, want to go on to copper immediately? Yeah, well, just to comment, where is uh, where's cheap foreign labor, illegal labor when you need it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that that's probably part of the, the labor tightness story now is that a, a lot of people uh, who would have otherwise come over the border illegally mm -hmm. don't feel like that's a very good bet right now. Well, and we are seeing a, a diminishing flow of people coming in, which means the jobs they used to fill are going unfilled or, um, or the they're, price they're has to go up to get Americans to take them. Right. Yeah. You know, if, if, if um, Mexican workers coming over the border would do a job for eight bucks an hour and they're not here anymore, then you got to figure out what Americans need to be paid to do that same job if you want the job done. And it's probably more like $15 an hour. Mm -hmm. So that's it's least, another aspect yeah. of wage inflation that we're seeing. I'm with you. Well, I've come up with a system. I've come up with an idea to solve the influx over the border. Stop it dead. And it's in my latest newsletter. So make sure you go over to this site, financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Sign up for the newsletter. Here's the deal. So what is the most powerful economic force in the universe, John? besides compounded interest. The free market, Gary. Yes. Is that right? right. Okay, good. Capitalism, <laughs> right? Privatization, people pursuing your own interest to improve your lot in life. So, you know, it just occurred to me, you ever watch that show? It's an awful show. I can't watch it. Dog the Bounty Hunter. But what happens is we have these bounty enforcement officers and they were half-assed kind of authorized by an 1873 case in the Supreme Court, which said that in dicta, it wasn't the holding of the case, that when you uh, when you allow yourself to be bailed out from jail, a bond posted, a surety as they call it, which ensures that you're going to show up for your trial, your hearing, uh, you basically give up your life and they can do anything with you short of torturing you to get you to appear to save their bond. So, you know, you've got like thousands of these bail enforcement officers around the country. Certain states have outlawed it. Illinois has gotten rid of cash bail altogether. So I'm sure they've got a zillion fugitives out there that they wouldn't otherwise have. Uh, eventually, you know, the only way it's skin in the game, the only way to get them to show up is m put a price on their head. So here's the deal, John. We we create private border enforcement officers, and for each illegal they catch within a certain distance of the border, they get paid five hundred to a thousand dollars. If the person is a has a a record, is um, you know a chronic border crosser, or a coyote, they get a a bonus on top of that. How long do you think we'd have illegals crossing the border for once? And they have to be certified, go through a training course that's uh, specified standards are created by the Border Patrol. How long do you think we'd have a border problem after that happened? <laughs> I don't know. Well, that, uh, see, the way I think um, that, that markets attack problems is the best way rather than having the government come up with one single solution. So if, if you try lots of different things to see what works, which is how markets work, you tend to get a better outcome. And so your idea should be tried, right? Right. Pick yeah, a place, in the market give it a place try, of ideas. Yeah. Like try it in Brownsville or try it in Laredo, those horrible places that are, or, you know, Juarez or, <laughs> well, you can't really do it in Tijuana. You need states where people are licensed to carry because no one in their right mind is going to do this job without being uh, armed. I mean, you have to be armed by just like being a bounty hunter. And and the amazing thing, John, is that there 
the largest law enforcement organization in the United States is the Border Patrol. It's got six over 60,000 employees and close to 50,000 sworn officers. And when you figure out they're apprehending 400,000 people a year at the border, then the cost per apprehension is over $10,000. That's not including processing anything else just to take them. And the other thing is there's 20,000 border patrol agents stationed on the Mexican border. It's 2000 miles long. And, you know, when you take uh, pregnancy leave out and sick leave and vacation days and personal days, there's probably 50 people patrolling the border at any given time, you know, due to union regulations, probably if it gets too hot, they don't allow them to go out there. You know, you know how it is government workers. It's like, uh, they're, they're never working anyway. They probably have to like write 15 reports before they're allowed to leave the station and go chase illegals. And then God forbid they capture some, then they're going to be writing reports for the next two days and they're not going to be out there. So if we're lucky, there's 250 border patrol agents patrolling that border at any given time and they're doing the best they can, but their best is not good enough. And the wall is just not going to be built fast enough. We won't even need the wall if we do what I said. I guarantee you, you know, these people could make six figures and, uh, you know, provide a public service too. Yeah. Okay. All right. We're going to try it then, right? We just got to get to Trump and get him to do it again, right? So uh, well, you guys are friends. Yeah. Right? Well, so. We go way back. <laughs> we haven't talked in 20 years, but we do go way back. So, so anyways, so, so looking at, Copper, Dr. Copper, as they call it, because Dr. Copper knows what the economy is going to do before the economy has even thought of it. And yet it's crashed the past couple of weeks down, you know, 20 percent. Is that right? Is it down 60 cents? Yeah. Eh, maybe 15 percent. It's down from uh, 320, 330 down to was below 290. So it's down quite a bit. It's sending out uh, tremors signals, isn't it? Yeah, well, China or er Copper is all about China, basically. China is building um, a, a post-industrial economy from scratch, which means new cities and roads and airports going up everywhere. Uh, and they're sucking in most of the world's industrial commodities. So the prices of things like copper depend on what China is up to. And this whole trade war thing is raising the specter of slower growth for China. In other words, if they don't run a massive trade surplus with the US, they have less cash on hand to build out all the new cities and roads and bridges, et cetera, et cetera, that they're building out, which means lower demand for copper and all the other industrial commodities that go into big projects like that. So traders are selling copper and other things leading to price declines, uh, which means we, we have to see how the trade war thing plays out before we know what the future is for, or at least the immediate future is for copper and the other industrial commodities. And there's no way to know how this goes. I, I suspect that they'll cut a deal, right? That's yeah. that's the logical way for this to play out. They, they yell at each other a little bit, <laughs> impose some tariffs on some things, inflict enough pain to make it worth cutting a deal. And then they cut a deal and then we're no longer in a trade war. Then it's back to whatever China has decided it wants to do in terms of its development, which is probably, at least in the short run, a positive thing for copper. So it could be that it's a buy at this level because the trade war can end at four o'clock in the morning with a Trump tweet, right? You yeah. <laughs> can say, okay, I think we got what we wanted. <laughs> I love China. We're friends again. You know, he, that could happen. And yeah, at great that people, point, the Chinese, they're wonderful people. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> and so, and so it, when that happens, industrial commodities gap up mm -hmm. at the next opening of the commodities markets. Uh, so I don't know. I, I don't have any thought on how to trade this because it's not really a fundamental trade or even a technical trade. It's a personal trade. What, what these guys get up to when they, when they talk, you know, and, and, um, I, I think longer term, we've got a recession in the not too distant future, just based on trends, for instance, rising inflation in the U S leading to rising interest rates, um, which will probably slow the economy in the U S down and by implication, the rest of the world. Well, it, it, you know, a rising dollar and rising U S interest rates are also bad for the emerging markets, which are already in crisis to an extent. 
mm-hmm. Brazil, Argentina, um, even China has is feeling the effects of all the dollars that it's borrowed and now has to pay off in more expensive dollars because the dollar's up relative to the yuan. So a lot of the emerging markets out there are already slowing down or are in later stages of a crisis because of trends in the currency markets, because the dollar went up after they borrowed a bunch of dollars. Uh, and, And that is a negative for the global economy. That'll slow down the global economy too. And then you've got Europe, which is in its usual crisis with Italy this time yeah. instead of Greece being the, the epicenter of it, but they've mm-hmm. got issues too. So it's completely um, feasible that 2019 is either a slowdown year or a recession year for the global economy. And that's really bad for industrial commodity prices. So it, it's completely possible that we see um, copper after it's been beaten down lately spike when the, uh, the mm-hmm. trade war thing ends, but then trend back down as the global economy slows down. Now, I, I don't know how, yeah, I, well, I don't think anybody should trade on what I just said, <laughs> but but that's yeah, one trade at your very peril. feasible sequence. Yeah. What about crude? Crude hits 75 bucks the barrel. Yeah. yeah. And well, crude's like, and, is similar to copper, isn't it? It, it, it is, but it's a Middle East story rather than a China story. Right. Because right now we, heck, we might be at war with Iran and, and not to long. And that would lead to a spike in oil prices. Any kind of a disruption in the Middle East spikes oil prices, at least temporarily. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's possible that the markets at the same time, we're going into the summer driving season or we're we're deeply into the summer driving season in the US, which is normally a high demand time for um, oil. So it's cyclically or um, seasonally strong for oil. Uh, So it's possible that we see oil spike in the next few months based on geopolitics and seasonality, but then also trend down (laughs) if the global economy starts to slow down in 2019. Uh, But again, there are so many moving parts here that it's really hard to trade something like this when you've got geopolitics on the one hand, which means the personalities of the people in charge of these countries combined with the potential for mistakes when you've got their Mm -hmm. militaries near each other and, and, uh, and, you know, one, one, guy takes a shot that causes an incident which spins out of control, you know, that's always possible when you've got these guys bumping up against each other. Uh, So it's very hard to use fundamentals, fundamentals to make any sense out of the global commodities markets right now, because there are so many things that are not just supply and demand that are affecting their prices. Mm -hmm. Very, very true. But overall, the economy has been a lot stronger than we expected for the past 18 months. Uh, Maybe they'll stave it off. Certainly, this recession, if and when it should occur, is not going to happen before the election, you know? Well, you would think they won't let that happen because the, the normal pattern for an election is extreme monetary and fiscal ease. And then tightness afterwards, you know, you've got to buy the votes um, leading up to the election. And then whatever happens afterwards, you can handle that because you've got another couple of years before the next election. So that's the normal pattern. But it's more of a pattern with presidential elections than with midterm elections. But still, (laughs) you would expect them to be taking steps to keep the economy strong until after the elections, because this is a really consequential midterm. Mm hmm. It's completely possible that uh, the Democrats regain one or or well, both would be uh, that would be an extreme outcome. But they could they could regain one of the houses of Congress and then hamstring the government, which from a libertarian standpoint is probably the best case scenario. You know, you want your government to be hamstrung so it can't pass any new laws or raise (laughs) anybody's taxes or anything. But um, but that's something that could happen. And then that changes the calculus. Yeah. for a lot of these markets. So again, you know, there's so much going on. Uh, I, I think the, the dominant theme in the intermediate term, if you just tune out all the political noise, you get rising interest rates and a flattening yield curve, slowing the economy out there at some point. And mm-hmm. when that hits is anybody's guess, but we're heading into, as far as the yield curve goes, for instance, we're heading into inversion, which is a, a point where long-term rates are higher than short-term rates. And historically, that's got a perfect record for predicting recessions. Mm -hmm. So if that happens in the last 
part of 2018, then history says 2019 will be slower than maybe it seems like it should be now. So huh, could be, could be, it might go sputtering, um, sputtering to a, a halt or a recession. Very possible. You know, like you say, the yield curve is never wrong. And when money pays you more short term than long term, there's something fundamentally amiss. And you need to pay attention to that because if you don't, uh, history will repeat itself in that instance. I don't remember one instance, John, of a an inverted yield curve or a flat yield curve not leading to a recession. Do you? Not in the past few decades. Yeah, I, a there might have been some pre-World War II stuff, but um, lately it's been a very good indicator. And see, the thing that's that's really scary now is that we've built up so much debt mm -hmm. that a recession is not just a recession anymore. It's an existential threat to the system. Mm -hmm. So you really can't know what's going to happen in the next slowdown because we've never had this much debt before. Uh, we, we've well, after having a debt driven crisis that almost blew up the global economy in 2008, 2009, we didn't pare back our debts. We took on much, much more. We doubled the, the government's debt and we more than doubled student loans and car loans and corporate debt is at record levels. And it just goes on and on. We are highly leveraged at every um, level of every major society out there around the world, not just in the U.S. So when things start to turn down, which is usually accompanied by some big, um, big crises out there, big companies go bankrupt or sectors of major economies have big problems. It's not clear that those things are going to be isolated events within the recession that that don't really cause any systemic problems. You could see dominoes start to fall and the debts that have been taken on in other sectors blowing up and, and causing that domino to fall and so on until you get a, a cascade failure of the system. That is completely possible now because we're so highly leveraged. So you always have to keep that in mind. When, when we're talking about a recession, you, you don't go back to 1990 or whatever and look at that recession and say, oh, we're going to have one of those. OK, no, no big deal. This could be a whole different animal. This could be 2008, 2009 on steroids. This could be the 1930s again. And there, that's not ideological and that's not any kind of mystical, magical. I don't have any kind of um, um, secret indicator telling me that that's possible. It's just common sense. When you borrow immense amounts of money, weird stuff happens, dangerous stuff happens. And we've spent the last decade borrowing more money than we've ever borrowed in the past. So expect crazy times to accompany the next recession. And if it's 2019, that's pretty soon. That's yeah. uh, five months away. And within the year that happens five months from now, crazy times return. So I, I think we should all be on guard against this because you, you can't take on this kind of debt without taking on commensurately big risks. And that's what we've done. Oh, yeah. That is what we have done and what we continue to do. And these things generally don't have a happy ending. Just a question of when, not if. I think the timing will be further out than anybody thinks possible. But because I just think things are kind of like in motion. It's the battleship thing, how long it takes to turn a battle, battleship around. Anyways, uh, that's it for today. So, John, uh, find John's work over at dollarcollapse.com. We're at financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Sign up for both our newsletters, Twitter feeds at Carrie Lutz, the Facebook page, Financial Survival Network. And as always, uh, hey, send me an email so I have something to do when I go to the Social Justice Warrior Coffee Roasters. You know who I'm talking about. They welcome the homeless. They welcome drug addicts. If you ever can't find a bathroom, you can always find one there. And you can mooch off their Wi-Fi forever, and they'll never kick you off. I mean, hey, if that's what Social Justice Warriors warriorism is all about, then I'm totally in favor of it. John, we'll talk to you next week. Okay, Carrie. Talk to you. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. <laughs>